Welcome to week two of Old Testament survey. I trust that you've had a good week and our discussion from last week was beneficial to you. Uh, just some housekeeping uh, things that we need to attend to just by way of reminder. Each week you will find your reading assignments for the week in assignment number one on your student portal. And I certainly encourage you to stay up with your readings. That is vitally important for you uh, for several reasons. Number one, it's vitally important for you to be able to answer the questions at the end of each chapter. And it's also important for you to be able to give uh, uh, good definitions of the terms on your definition list in assignment number two each week. So please stay up with your readings. Now, another reason you need to do that is on uh, week 10, one of the assignments will just simply be a question. Have you completed all of your readings uh, for the quarter? If you answer no to that question, then you'll have a grade reduction uh, on your final grade. So it is important not only to complete the assignments, but also uh, to maintain a good grade average as we go through this quarter. Now, last week in week number one, we began uh, by way of introduction to the Old Testament. And uh, today in week number two, we're going to continue in that same vein. We're gonna continue with an introduction to the Old Testament. So let's dive in. We're going to begin this week with a discussion of events in the Old Testament. And you might think, well, that's sort of strange. Why would we do that by way of introduction when we're gonna do that in detail as we go through the books of the Old Testament? Well, it's good to begin with to just to get a broad inner, uh, overview of uh, the basic makeup of the Old Testament and the historical events that are contained there, that are recorded in the Old Testament. So let's give some thought this week to uh, some of those events in the Old Testament. Now it's vitally important for us to remember that uh, the Old Testament covers a wide range of years. When you compare it with the New Testament, it's vastly different. The New Testament only covers about 100 years uh, of the history of the church whereas the Old Testament covers almost 2,000 years of history. And so it's a huge difference in time uh, when you compare the Old Testament to the New Testament. A lot of time is covered in the record of the Old Testament books. Now the Old Testament, when we begin thinking about it, it deals specifically with the nation of Israel. Now, that's vitally important for us to remember as well because Israel is God's chosen people, always has been, always will be. Uh, they have a special purpose and a plan in God's economy, and we'll, we'll see that as we go through and develop an understanding of the different books of the Old Testament. But to begin with, let's just remember that the Old Testament deals specifically with the nation of Israel, and uh, and it also deals with how other nations interacted with and how Israel interacted with other nations and how all of that comes into play in the history. Remember that Israel is not an island unto itself. The Old Testament contains historical events that uh, refer to Israel's interrelations with other nations. Sometimes those relations were good and healthy. Other times those relations were very unhealthy and it took the people of Israel away from their commitment to God. And so an understanding of history in the Old Testament is, is so essential for us to understand uh, the whole makeup of the entire uh, record that we have in the, in the 39 books of the Old Testament. Now, when we begin looking at the Old Testament, specifically in relation to Israel, now, of course, we're skipping over a lot of time, and we'll go back and develop that as we get into further studies. But to begin looking at the nation of Israel specifically, we begin with a period of time called the Patriarchal Age, the age of the patriarchs. And uh, we would love to be able to give precise dates to the lifetimes and the events that are recorded for us in the Patriarchal Age, but that's pretty much impossible to do. We, we have some time markers, and we'll talk about those as we go through. But just remember from the very beginning that a lot of the dates that we have in the Old Testament, the dating that we've given to the events in the Old Testament, are a lot of times just speculative and based on the best information that we have. 
purpose of the uh, study is to trace the development of the uh, nation of Israel. And uh, again, the dating of some of those events is pretty much impossible, very uncertain for us to determine with any specificity. So we have to remember that as we embark on this study of the Old Testament books. Now, as we began uh, thinking about the age of the patriarchs, of course, we began with Abraham, the father of the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are generally placed in the Middle Bronze Age, which is dated somewhere between 2000 BC and 1550 BC, sometime within that time range. Now, Abraham, of course, is thought to have been early in that, somewhere around the year 2000. Uh, specific dating, precise dating is impossible, but according to all the knowledge that we have, all the records that we have, Abraham's history begins somewhere around the year 2000 BC. Now, when Abraham was commanded by God to leave Ur of the Chaldees and move to Canaan, God then made a covenant with Abram, uh, a covenant that is still intact today. And in that covenant, God unconditionally made Abram several promises, again, that are still intact uh, today. And when God gave him these promises, it was not only for Abram, it was for all of Abram's descendants. And of course, Abram is the father of the nation of Israel. And so all of Israel is contained in these promises of God. But in Genesis chapter 12, we learn that not only is the nation of Israel contained in this unconditional promise of God to Abram, we have all the nations. And, and how they interact with the nation that God is going to bring into existence through Abram and his descendants, all the nations of the world are going to be judged as to how they relate to the nation of Israel. And so the promises that are in Genesis chapter 12, uh, verse 1 and following, are essential for us as Gentiles to understand as well. And it's important for us to understand that God made these promises to Israel and they are still for Israel, and still God is going to judge nations in the present day in the same way that he judged nations in the Old Testament era as to how they related to and dealt with his chosen people, the people of Israel. Now, the Israelites were in Egypt and uh, probably this was somewhere between 1700 and 1550 B.C. Uh, we understand that they were in Egypt because God placed them there to provide for them during a horrible time of famine. And we'll get into a lot of that detail as we move on into the uh, books of Genesis and Exodus. But for right now, let it suffice to say that they were there uh, so that they might be able to have all of their needs met in this terrible time of famine. And it was during those 400 plus years that they were in G Egypt that the nation of Israel uh, grew astronomically in population. There was only 70 people that went down into Egypt and there were probably somewhere around two and a half million Israelites that came out of Egypt at the end of that uh, Egyptian period of slavery. And so God blessed them not only by providing for them and protecting them from the famine, putting them in a safe place, even though they experienced tremendous hardship while they were there, but God still provided for them and protected them. And then as God made it possible for them to make their exodus from uh, Egypt, God provided for them through the means of the Egyptian people. And so we see God's hand of grace actively at work during this time uh, of the uh, history of the nation of Israel. Now, after this extended period of time, the Israelites were driven out of Egypt after God has performed this series of 10 miracles, these 10 plagues that he brought against the nation of Israel. And all of those ten plagues were given so that God might display his power uh, 
and his presence not only to the people of Israel, but also to the people of Egypt. God was revealing his power as God of gods. Uh, he was explaining, displaying his, his power in such a way that it would leave no question to the people of Israel as to how powerful he was and that he was their God and he was going to see to it that their safety was really an issue that he was going to bring about for them and all of the provisions. And yet we see that uh, shortly after their exodus, they already begin complaining against God. And so we can apply that to the modern day. We can apply that because so often we see people who are blessed enormously by God, and yet soon after the blessing, uh, they seem to forget the blessing of God and, and walk away from it. And maybe they've made promises to God in the midst of the, the difficulty that God was saving them from. And when God does provide deliverance, they still revert back because we so soon forget of the blessings of God. Well, that's what happened to the nation of Israel. Now, God did raise up this man, this uh, Moses, this emancipator that was going to go, and God was going to use Moses to display his power to the people of Israel and to the people of Egypt and use Moses then to deliver the people out of that Egyptian bondage and bring the people into a place of freedom that was provided by the sovereignty of God. Now, we're going to skip way ahead in time for just a moment and, and just think about, again, one of the major events in the Old Testament. Now, please understand that when we go from Moses to David, we've gone through quite a few hundred years again. You remember that at the end of Moses' life, Joshua was raised up as the successor to Moses, and uh, Joshua led the people in their uh taking con uh, complete control of and possession of the promised land. And then after that, after Joshua's death, it ensued a period of time recorded in the book of Judges. And we really don't know exactly how long that period of time lasted, but probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 years again, before we come to the point in history where we see the development of Israel's statehood, Israel's national uh, independence from other nations and, and establishment as a monarchy rather than a theocracy. Now, that was a major move away from God, of course, but still this is one of the major events in the Old Testament that we must give serious consideration to. Changes began to take place uh, around the world. There were major world powers the, that were coming into play coming into conflict with the nation of Israel, with the Israelite people. Uh, some of the major ones were the Egyptians and the Hittites and the Philistines. And all of these different world powers, these national entities, interacted with the nation of Israel all during this period of time. And uh, these would grow in power and then wane in power. They would influence Israel in powerful ways and then in not so powerful ways. But we understand that all of this time, God was interacting uh, the, with the people of Israel in such a way as that brought them into play with the other nations of the world. Now, the Sea Peoples, or the Philistines, invaded the land and actually created a vacuum in the land, a power vacuum in the land, where the Egyptian and the Hittite powers had once existed. And uh, it was always a conflict between the nation of Israel and the Philistine nations, the Sea Peoples, as we go through the Old Testament. And all of this, all of this historical uh, events, these significant historical events, are leading up to that pivotal point in Israel's history where they actually turn away from God and God's theocratic rule over the nation and cry out to be like all the other nations. We want to be like everyone else, they cried. They, they asked Samuel to, to make a king over us because we want to be like all the other nations. And so they became 
totally dissatisfied with the rule of God. And the way God had ruled, of course, was by raising up these uh, leaders, these judges, to give leadership to the people of Israel. And they became tired of that. They wanted to be like everyone else. They didn't want God to be their ruler in the sense of God appointing these judges to rule over them. They wanted a king so that they could be identified with all the other nations in the world. And this ultimately led to the beginning of the monarchy. Now, God raised up a king in response to the people's cry. They go to Samuel and they cry out for a king so that we can be like all the other nations. And God gave them what they wanted. And it was a disaster. Saul was the first king of Israel, and certainly Saul was God's choice. God is the one that told Samuel that Saul would be the first king of Israel. And it was a disaster, and because and the reason it was a disaster is because God was showing them exactly what they could look forward to in rejecting him as their theocratic leader and becoming a monarchy led by a human being instead of looking to God for his leadership. And we see how disastrous that was because Saul, of course, disobeyed God, rebelled against God's clear instruction, and it displayed to the people of Israel that in order to be like all the other peoples of the world, we're going to have leaders that are not going to lead us in the ways of God. So after that first 40-year reign of the disastrous rule of Saul, the first king of Israel, God then raised up David. And again, he used Samuel to go and select David from the sons of Jesse. And David began to be the ruler of Israel that all other rulers from this point on would be compared to. David is raised up. He serves for, for 40 years. And uh, his kingdom, uh, his rule unites the entirety of the nation of Israel. It is a unified, united kingdom under the rule of David. And for those years, they experienced great prosperity. They experienced the overwhelming blessings of the hand of God, even though there were epics and eras in, in that 40-year period of time in which David himself rebelled against God. He made some very poor decisions. And yet the testimony of God himself about David is, David is a man after my own heart. So God now, after the disaster of Saul's reign, God shows the people what they can experience if they have a leader who will follow the rule of God. And David is that man. And so for 40 years, the kingdom is united and the kingdom is blessed and uh, they prosper greatly during this 40-year period of time. Now, there are other major world powers that we see in the Old Testament. And I'm going to give you a list of them here. Uh, and these extend far beyond the rule of David. As a matter of fact, they extend all the way to the end of the Old Testament and even into the beginning years of the New Testament. We look at the history of the Old Testament and we see that there are these major world powers that arise and then they're defeated by another and for a while they are in power and then another and then another. We see the Assyrian Empire that was in play when the northern kingdom of Israel, well, let me back up just a moment. After David's reign, and the kingdom was united during his reign, his son Solomon came to the throne, and he too ruled for 40 years. And again, it was a reign of relative peace because of all the uh, military victories David had made. And Solomon comes to the throne, and he rules in a relative period of peace and prosperity. And yet at the end of his reign, after his death, there's a division of the kingdom. There are 10 of the tribes of Israel that become the northern kingdom of Israel, and there are two tribes that become the southern kingdom of Judah. And from this period on, no longer is it a unified kingdom, but rather it's a divided kingdom. The kings of the northern kingdom were all evil. 
and they were wicked. They led the people of Israel away from God. And ultimately, God began raising up prophets to go and try to warn the people and call them to repentance, call them to return to God. And uh, over a long period of time, God finally said, I've had enough, in essence, and he allowed the Assyrians to capture and destroy the northern kingdom of Israel. It took place in the year 722 B.C. After the Assyrian Empire had risen to power, they began to wane in power and ultimately were taken over, conquered by the Babylonian Empire. Now, God is now going to use the Babylonians to bring judgment against the southern kingdom of Judah. Judah should have learned some wonderful and powerful lessons from the fall of their sister to the north, and yet they didn't. They made the same mistakes, and they rebelled against God. And so in 586, 587 B.C., God brought the Babylonians under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar against the southern kingdom of Judah, Jeremiah prophesied that they would stay in captivity to the Babylonians for 70 years, and that's exactly the way it played out in the history of the Old Testament. But after the rise of the Babylonian Empire, they began to wane, and the Medo-Persian Empire came into place. After the Medo-Persian Empire, it was the Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire. Of course, the Roman Empire was in place in the New Testament. So we see all the way back to the middle of the 8th century B.C., all the way through to the end of the Old Testament, we have these major world powers that are coming into play in their interaction with the nation of Israel. So Israel, again, is not an island unto itself. We have Israel working its, its own purposes and plans out with all the conflicts that they have to go through with the other nations that surround them and these world powers that come into play through the history of the Old Testament. Now, when we come to the Old Testament itself and begin looking at the books of the Old Testament, the first major section of the Old Testament is referred to as the Pentateuch. Pentateuch refers to the first five books of the Bible, and the basic meaning is five scrolls. It covers the history of Israel from the beginning of time, actually, all the way back to creation, to, but not including Israel's conquest of the promised land. So it covers that wide expanse of time. Now, Torah is the Jewish designation for these first five books. So Pentateuch, Torah, law, these are all terms that are used in reference to the first five books of the Bible. Now, the Pentateuch is the story of the nation of Israel, where they came from, and we've already established the fact that they were created by God himself through his activity in the life of one man, how they developed as a nation, and again, that all goes back even to the uh, 430 years that they spent in uh, Egyptian bondage, and how they were saved from destruction, and so many other lessons that we learn from these first five books in the Bible. But the Pentateuch is much more than just a trace of the history of Israel. For instance, just a sampling of some of the things that we're going to see uh, during this survey of the Old Testament. The first five books of the Bible certainly show us the sovereignty of God, the control of God. God's purposes and plans are going to be worked out in minute detail according to his will. Nothing can circumvent or usurp or overthrow the will of God. His will is going to be done. We can go back to Genesis chapter 12 again and remind ourselves of that unconditional promise that God made to Abram. Now, what we mean by unconditional promise is there's no strings attached. God didn't say to Abram, if you do this, I'll do this. God just simply said to Abram, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to bless all the nations of the earth through you. I'm going to bless those nations that bless you. I'm going to curse those nations that curse you. It was all 
a sovereign act of God. And then the uh, ensuing history of Israel, as recorded in the Old Testament then, unfolds that sovereign plan of God, that his plan is going to work out regardless of what man might do or strive to do. So we certainly see the sovereignty of God. And we'll talk about this particular subject over and again as we go through Old Testament 101 and 102. We also see, as we've already said, the history of Israel. The Old Testament is a record and an account of God raising up this nation and then how this nation evolved, so to speak, through the, the years and years and years of recorded history in the Old Testament. Then we see also the fallen condition of humanity. The book of Genesis tells us about the fact that God created a, uh, a human couple, Adam and Eve. He placed them in a pristine paradise where they had everything at their disposal. And yet they decided to rebel against God by disobeying that one command of God. And thereby and therewith we see the fallen condition of humanity. All, as Paul says in the New Testament, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it's because, as Paul teaches in Romans, Adam is the federal head of humanity. And when Adam sinned, all of humanity sinned with him. So we see the total fallenness of humanity in these first five books of the Old Testament. We also see how God, even though he has he has seen his creation, his crown of creation, humanity, rebel against him. God still, in his love and compassion and grace, implements a plan of salvation, whereby fallen humanity can be redeemed and brought back into fellowship and relationship with Almighty God. Then we see in the ensuing books of the Pentateuch, God's demand for holiness. Now, God demands of the people of Israel that they be holy. As a matter of fact, in the, uh, these Old Testament books that we, we call to the, uh, the Pentateuch, uh, there are times that God says, be holy as your Father is holy. In other words, you should strive, we should strive to be just like God. Now, that command is all, it's repeated again in the, in the New Testament. Peter says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. We should settle for nothing less than total perfection. Now, can we really experience total perfection? Well, in our fallenness, no, we cannot. But by the grace of God and the redemptive power of God, we can live holy lives. And so, all the way back in the Old Testament, in the first five books of the Bible, God establishes the fact that he demands of his people uh, a level of holiness, a level of striving after perfection. And some of uh, these are some of the ideas that we come across as we study these first five books of the Bible. So you see why uh, a study of the Old Testament is vitally important for us, because these things... These truths are what we see played out, so to speak, in the New Testament. So it's vitally important that we lay this foundation as we go through these books of the Old Testament. Now, the question we're going to address now is who wrote the Pentateuch? More often than not, you'll hear people say that Moses is the author of these first five books. And up until uh, really recent years, uh, this was not questioned. And we'll talk about that in a little while, or in, actually in next week's session, about theories that arose during the Enlightenment period uh, that began to question uh, uh, Moses' authorship. But there are some passages that would lead us to believe that Moses wrote at least parts of the Pentateuch. And you can see those listed there on your screen. Now, just simply because uh, we don't have an attestation to Mos Mosaic authorship in all of the books doesn't mean that Moses didn't write them. Uh, 
It just means that we have certain passages that stipulate clearly and, and concretely that he did write those passages. And from that, it would lead us to believe probably Moses wrote all of them, even though the books don't necessarily claim Mosaic authorship. Yet when we come to the uh, modern critical analysis of the Bible, we begin to see people questioning Mosaic authorship. In the middle 1800s, and again, this is the reason I said it's not until modern times, and you might think, well, the middle 1800s isn't really modern times, but when you consider the fact that all of church history up until the mid-1800s attested to Mosaic authorship of the first five books of the Bible, then yes, we could refer to this as modern times. And in the 1800s, the con uh, consensus, <coughs> excuse me, the consensus was generally that Mo Moses did indeed write the first five books of the Bible. And then there, there arose those who began to question that. And out of that, uh, a hypothesis was created that we refer to now as the documentary hypothesis. And uh, critical approaches to Mosaic authorship began to say, no, Moses didn't write this. As a matter of fact, what we have now the final edition of what we have in these first five books of the Bible were actually compiled, written hundreds of years after Moses' lifetime. And so this, this hypothesis was developed, referred to as the documentary hypothesis. Now I'm just going to real briefly go over this with you today. And in future studies, not necessarily in this Old Testament survey, but in future studies, that you will go through as you continue your studies here at Fruitland, you will be uh, address, uh, introduced more uh, in detail to the documentary hypothesis. The documentary hypothesis is referred to oftentimes as the JEDP theory. And so each one of those letters, J, E, D, and P, represent a different aspect of who wrote parts or who edited parts of what we now have in the first five books of the Bible and even beyond that. The J refers to the Jehovist or the Yahwist. Now those who go into the Old Testament and really go into great detail looking at the different names of God, well there are those who say there are certain parts of the Old Testament, specifically in the Pentateuch, where Jehovah or Yahweh is supposed supposed to be the, uh, the name for God that is used most often. And so those who hold to the Jehovah's theory say that uh, it wasn't written until about 850 B.C., a long, long time after Moses' lifetime, and it's written in simple narrative form, and it presents God in what we refer to as anthropomorphical language. In, in other words, God is presented uh, with the descriptions and the depictions of humanity, the eye of God, the arm of God. Uh, those depictions are used in reference to the Jehovah's or the Yahwist. Now, Elohist, and that's E. And Elohim is another name for God. Yahweh, Elohim. Well, it's written supposedly as a corrective to the J document. Now, the J document places overwhelming emphasis on Jehovah or Yahweh. The Elohist, they put emphasis on Elohim. And it uses the less intimate name, which is Elohim for God, and it avoids uh, those terms that would uh, describe God in human terms, anthropomorphic terms. Now, it is supposed uh, by these that J and E, the Jehovah's and the Elohist documents were combined sometime after 722 B.C. Now, note particularly the time frame. 722 B.C. is when the northern kingdom of Israel fell at the hands of the Assyrians. And so supposedly sometime after that, the 
documents that were contained in the Jehovist and the documents that were contained in the Elohist are now combined some at some point after the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel. Come to the D document, the Deuteronomic doctrine. doctrine. And uh, what this actual doc, uh, document is supposed to have done is to place emphasis on the cultic worship of the nation of Israel. So, again, we're seeing how all these different ideas come into play. So when you read through the Old Testament, you have to determine, was this written by a Jehovah's? Was this written by an Elohist? Was this written by a Deuteronomist? Uh, what's the emphasis here? Is the emphasis on Jehovah? Is the emphasis on Elohim? Is the emphasis on cultic worship and the purity of the nation of Israel? And then J, E, and D were supposedly combined sometime after the year 587 B.C. And note again the significance of the date. 587 is when the uh, fall of the southern kingdom of Judah took place at the hands of the Babylonians. So now we've got all three of these different documents and all this evidence that's being compiled and we're seeing some elements of the Jehovah's, some elements of the Elohist, and some elements of the Deuteronomist, all combined after the year 587. And finally, we've got the P document, the priestly document, and it is supposed to have been written midway through the 5th century B.C. Now, it's written to a address the deficiencies in the priestly concerns. As we come toward the end of the Old Testament, after they have fallen at the hands of the Babylonians and have experienced 70 years in captivity, then this document is supposedly to bring the people back to an understanding of the priestly role. So, uh, 